What's the difference between violence on the individual level versus group? Is um, it seems like with chimps and with wolves, there's something about the dynamic of m multiple uh, chimps together that increase the chance of violence. Or is is violence still fundamentally part of the individual? Like, would the, would an individual be as violent as they might be as part of a group? If we're talking about uh, killing, killing, then um, violence in the sense of killing is very much associated with uh, a group. And the reason is that individuals uh, don't benefit by getting into a fight in which they risk being hurt themselves. So it's only when you have overwhelming power that the temptation to try and kill another victim uh, rises sufficiently for them to be motivated to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the average number of chimpanzee males that attack a single male in uh, something like 50 observations that have accumulated in the last 50 years uh, from various different study sites is eight, eight to one. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it can go as low as uh, three to one, mm -hmm. but that's, a, that's getting risky. But if you have eight, you can see what can happen. I mean, basically, uh, you have one male on one foot, another male on another foot, another male on an arm, another male on another arm, now you have an immobilized victim with uh, four individuals capable of just doing the damage. Mm -hmm. And so they can then move in and tear out his thorax and tear off his testicles and, and twist an arm until it breaks and, uh, and do this you know, appalling damage with no weapons. Mm -hmm. What is uh, the way in which they prefer to commit the violence? Is there something to be said about like the actual process of it? Is there an artistry to it? So if you look at human warfare, there's different parts in history prefer different kind of approaches to violence. It had more to do with tools, I think, on the human side. But just the nature of violence itself, the, the sorry, the practice, the strategy of violence, is it basically the same? You improvise, you immobilize the, uh, the victim and they just rip off different parts of their body kind of thing? Yeah, you, you have to understand that uh, these things are happening at high speed um, in thick vegetation, yes. mostly, so that they, they have not been filmed uh, carefully. <laughs> you know, we, we have a few yes. little glimpses of them from uh, uh, one or two people like David Watts, uh, who's got some great video, but uh, we don't know enough to be able to, to say that. It's hard for me to imagine that there are styles that vary between um, communities, you know, cultural styles, but you know, it is possible. And, and one thing that is striking is that the number of times that an individual victim has been killed immediately uh, has been higher in uh, Kibali Forest in Uganda uh, than in, in Gombe National Park in Tanzania. It's conceivable that's just chance. We don't have real numbers now, but what is this? Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but you know, ten versus uh, fifteen or something. Um, so, so maybe they damage to the point of uh, expecting a death in one place, and they just finish it off in the other. But most likely, that sort of difference will be due to differences in the numbers of attackers. You know, human beings are able to conceive of the philosophical notion of death, of mortality. Is there any of that uh, for chimps when they're thinking about violence? Is violence, like what? what is the nature of their conception of violence, do you think? Do they, do they realize they're taking another conscious being's life? Or is it some kind of like optimization over the use of resources or something like that? I, I don't think it's, I can't think of any way to get an answer to the question sure. of, of what they know about that. Um, I think that uh, the way to think about the motivation is uh, rather like uh, the motivation in sex. So when males are interested in having sex with a female, whether it's uh, in chimpanzees or in humans, 
uh, they don't think about the fact that what this is going to do is to lead to a baby. Mostly. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> mostly what they're thinking about is, I want to get my end away. Uh, and um, I think that that's a, it's a similar kind of process uh, with the chimps. You know, what they are thinking about is, uh, I, w I want to kill this, yes. this individual. And it's hard to imagine that uh, taking the other individual's perspective and thinking about what it means for them to die is going to be an important part of that. In fact, you know, there's, there's reasons to think it should not be an important part of it because it might inhibit them and they, they don't want to be inhibited. You know, the more efficient they are in uh, doing this, the better. But, uh, you know, I think it's interesting to think about this whole motivational question because it does um, produce the sort of rather haunting thought that there has been selection in favor of enthusiasm about killing. And in our relatively gentle and uh, you know, deliberately moral society that we have today, it's very difficult for us to face the thought that uh, in uh, all of us, there might have been uh, a res residue and, and a, more than that, sort of you know, actively uh, an active potential for that thought of you know, really enjoying ki killing someone else. But I, I think you know, one can sustain that thought fairly obviously by thinking of circumstances in which it would be true that the ordinary human male would be delighted to be part of a group that was killing someone. What you've got to do is to be in a position where you're regarding the victim as dangerous and uh, thoroughly hostile. But the pure enjoyment of violence, there's, uh, I don't know if you know, this historian, Dan Carlin, he has a podcast. He has an episode, three, four hour episode that I recommend to others, it's quite haunting. But he takes us through an entire history, uh, it's called painfotainment the uh, the history of humans enjoying the murder of others in a large group. So like ex public executions were part of long part of human history. And there's something that um, for some reason humans seem to have been drawn to just watching others die. And he ventures to say that that may still be part of us. For example, he said, if it was possible to televise to stream online, for example, the execution and the, the murder of somebody, or even the torture of somebody, that uh, a very large fraction of the population on earth would not be able to look away. They'd be drawn to that somehow. As a very dark thought that we were drawn to that. So you think that's part of us in there somewhere, that selection that we evolved for the enjoyment of killing and the enjoyment of observing uh, those in our tribe doing the killing. Yes, I mean, and, and that, that word you produced at the end is critical, I think, you know, because uh, it would be a little bit weird, I think, uh, to imagine a lot of enjoyment about people in your own tribe being killed. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think we're, we're interested in violence for, for violence's sake that yes. much. Yeah. Um, it's um, it's when you get these social boundaries set up, and in today's world, you know, happily, uh, we kind of are already one world. You know, we you have to dehumanize someone to get to the point where they are really outside, you know, our recognition of a tribe at some level, which is you know the whole human species. But in uh, ancient times, that would not have been true, because in ancient times, there are lots of accounts of hunters and gatherers uh, in which the appearance of a stranger would lead to an immediate response of shooting on sight, mm -hmm. because what was human was the people that were in your society, mm -hmm. and the other things that actually looked like us and you know were were human in that sense were not regarded as human. Mm -hmm. So the, there was a kind of automatic dehumanization of everybody that uh, didn't speak our language or hadn't already somehow 
become recognized as uh, sufficiently like us to escape the the, you know, the dehumanization context. And so hopefully the story of human history is that we are, uh, that tribalism fades away, that our dehumanization, the natural desire to dehumanize or tendency to dehumanize groups that are not within this tribe decreases over time. And so then the desire for violence decreases over time. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the optimistic perspective. And, uh, and the, the great sort of concern, of course, is that um, small conflicts can build up into bigger conflicts and then dehumanization happens and then violence is released. As Hannah Arendt says, you know, there mm -hmm. currently is no uh, known alternative to war as a means of settling really important conflicts.